Can diabetes be reversed? My name is Dr. Erica Steele. I'm a board certified naturopathic doctor. I hold six degrees in my field and they're all in the natural healthcare space. If you're interested in learning more about metabolic health, uh, I do have a course that's launching this month and it teaches you all about metabolic health and practical tips, tools uh, that you can do in order to take more full responsibility with your health and personal accountability and really be proactive uh, for change. So you don't just kind of be a victim to the circumstance, if you will. Um, Also too, if you want to join a like-minded community, please join my Discord. Uh, There's a lot of free resources in there as well as a community of people just like you that are on a holistic health journey. Uh, And as well, I have different webinars and email list and all kinds of things, goodies below. So go ahead and check that out. Can diabetes be reversed? So the first thing I'm going to say is yes, <laughs> yes and no. Um, so if it is a type one status, um, a lot of times uh, type one cannot be reversed. I'm not saying it's not impossible, uh, but very, very difficult. There's usually more uh, complicated genetic implications or congenital implications to type one diabetes. And just so we're clear, Type 1 is when you are insulin dependent and your pancreas is just no longer uh, producing or sensitive to uh, insulin. And so you you need to inject that within the system uh, to regulate your blood sugar. So there's that. Um, Type 2, which is the more common one, is absolutely reversible through uh, lifestyle changes. A lot of times diabetes type 2 happens over time um, and people are unaware of it. They're not conscious of their blood sugar. So first First thing I want people to be aware of is that your medical doctor, although really good in practice, they are trained to look for and identify and diagnose a disease. So they're not going to necessarily witness the trends over time. Some will, uh, some that are, you know, more specialized or, you know, they're more focused on these things, you know, they may point it out. Um, but a lot of times they're going to wait until let's say your numbers, your glucose number, let's say is, you know, over a hundred or your hemoglobin A1C maybe is like 5.6 or six, you know, they're going to, kind of wait until there is a concern and then tell you what to do. And so we don't want to wait. We want to be proactive. So um, we're looking for between 80 and 85 of your glucose number. And we really like no higher than a five uh, when it comes to your hemoglobin A1C. And I know those numbers are like super tight and narrow, but the reason for that is because those are preventative ranges. Those are ranges to which we want to ensure that are, you know, stable because without a stable foundation of blood sugar, uh, you know, we're not going to necessarily you know, be able to build health. So that's what we're looking for. Now, what goes into creating that number, right? So let's say you come in and your number is 95. How can I, you know, proactively address that? So first thing, before we get into all the action items, it's mindset. We have to really think about what we're doing. We have to be more proactive. We have to go, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Um, and I'm going to make a choice. I'm going to make a decision because change is going to be difficult and you may not necessarily see a result quickly. So you want to look at, you know, okay, I'm going to make a decision to change. Um, I'm going to contemplate this. I'm going to make a decision to change and I'm going to put a structure in place to make these changes, to make it easier and more efficiently. And then I'm going to, you know, implement this. So there's a, there's a lot of mindset that comes into it. Um, also too, on the emotional side, I notice that people with diabetes often, you know, are not sweet to themselves. They're not loving to themselves. They're not kind to themselves. So that's another distinction that we want to be aware of that if you have had a lot of emotional trauma, um, you're not necessarily going to, you know, be as motivated, let's say, because your thoughts then fuel your emotions and your emotions fuel your actions, habits, behaviors, lifestyles. So mindset, I cannot stress the importance of that in terms of deciding that you're ready to make that change. And then once you've made that decision to change, now we want to put some structures in place. What are those structures? That may mean doing some education on healthy nutrition or, you know, seeking a professional's help or joining an accountability group, or there must 
must be some structure that's different than what you're doing to stretch you outside of your comfort zone. So that's that's one piece. Once you have created that structure, now it's the implementation time. Now you're really going to put, you know, your your boots on the ground and really focus. So let's talk about what some of those actions may look like. And of course, a little bit different for everybody, but I tend to follow this order. So after we've gotten through mindset, we've processed some emotional stuff. Now we're going to look at making sure you're drinking adequate amounts of water. And what's adequate amounts of water? Half your body weight in ounces in water. Then we want to focus on your protein numbers, making sure that you're eating adequate amounts of protein, making sure that those numbers are high enough, right? So, you know, you can Google macro calendar, or excuse me, calculator, and then you can plug those numbers in and that will give you what your total numbers need to, to look like. Naturally, you know if you need to lose weight or that, those sorts of things. But then I really, we really focus in on your protein and getting your protein high because that's going to stabilize your, your blood sugar. Then we get your fat low. So, you know, fat, all kinds of fat, healthy fat, unhealthy fat, doesn't matter. The liver has to produce enough bile to be able to emulsify that fat. And a lot of times patients coming in, they have fatty liver or, you know, they're, they're, they have had gallbladder removal, you know, all kinds of things are going on with that particular you know, organ system. And so we want to make sure we keep the fat at, at, a, at a reasonable rate. And again, that macro calculator is going to show you that. It's going to show you what your, you know, total um, uh, proteins need to be, your total fats need to be, and then you fall into alignment. Now, there's all kinds of emotions that come up with just shifting those two numbers. So again, that's where, you know, you know, insight from a holistic doctor like myself can really help you to, to unpack what is going on around that space. Remember, fat helps us feel comforting. It helps us feel heavy, et cetera. Um, and then last thing we want to make sure is our calories. A lot of people don't eat enough calories. They starve themselves. Blood sugar is rocking and rolling up and down left and right. So we also want to make sure the calories are up. There's some other really good structures that we can implement, such as, let's say, fasting. So some people do intermittent fasting where they do um, you know, let's say 12, 12 hours on or 12 hours off or 14 and 10. And so that's another good way to almost biohack the system, but you still have to eat your, you know, daily calories as well as your daily uh, macros within that feeding window. You're, all you're doing is just compacting your feeding window. Um, and so you still have to make sure that you eat adequately and you drink your water in the same time. It's not just about starving yourself and then, you know, nibbling like a bird. So, um, that are some of the, the tools that you can do. Once you get your diet in order, that's when you can start exercising. Naturally, you want to do cardio. Um, I wouldn't do cardio every single day. I would alternate. I would do maybe cardio three or four times a week, really three times a week. And then I would do strength training on these other days. Always have one to two rest days. The other last thing I'll leave you with is making sure you have at least one cheat meal a week. I know that, you know, we may want a cheat day, <laughs> not a cheat day, but a cheat meal can really help with the psychology of deprivation if you feel like you're just kind of reducing yourself down and making sure that you have built that in so that if you do, let's say, want to eat something yummy that you don't have to, you know, think about all the structures, then, you know, you have that built in. So hopefully that helps you. If you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment below. I also do TikTok lives where I'll answer your uh, questions live. And then also we'll be doing some YouTube lives as well. So definitely check those out. Uh, super excited to, you know, support you on the journey. So if you're also looking to schedule one-on-one -on -one or a group consultation, please let us know by clicking the link below and like, share, subscribe for more.